And we are live. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the stream. I hope you're doing well, that you had a nice beginning of the week. Uh, I'm very happy to have you back here for another interview uh, with a member of the European Parliament. Uh, tonight, we will discuss with uh, MEP Nils Ushakovs uh, from the Socialist and Democrats groups on the, on the left side of EU politics. So he's, uh, he's Latvian, he's, he's 46 years old, and uh, he's been an MEP since 2019. So that's uh, his first uh, mandate as, as an MEP. And uh, he's a member of the Committee on Budget and the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs. Uh, something that is interesting and unusual, let's say, to, to, about uh, Mr. Ushakovs, uh, and we'll discuss that tonight, is that he's, uh, he's Latvian, but he's a Latvian-Russian, meaning that he's someone from the Russian ethnic minority, minority in Latvia. Uh, and his party back home, so Harmony, uh, represents mostly uh, latvian Russian. So given the context, uh, that will make for, for an interesting conversation, and we'll come back on that during, during the, uh, the interview. But before we actually start the, the conversation, as usual, I remind uh, to you the, the house rules for anyone who would be new with us tonight. So our guest will be with us with, for a bit less than an hour. After that, he will go and enjoy the rest of uh, his evening, and you will be stuck with me for another 30 minutes. Uh, to debrief what you thought of the interview, provide any additional explanation, answer questions I could not cover, these kind of things. Uh, as usual, I've prepared my own questions for Mr. Ushakovs, and I have collected questions from, from you guys on Reddit, on Discord, on Twitter, and all that. Uh, you can, of course, uh, ask your questions via the chat. It's there for that. I will keep an eye on it, and I will pick among your, your suggestions. So feel free to, to react, to participate, and all that. But as always, uh, don't spam and stay civil. So the goal of these interviews is for you to, to better understand who are your MEPs, what they do in Brussels, uh, what are their priorities, maybe some of their opinions on EU politics and uh, current news. Uh, we will not go too deep into policy and we will not go too deep as well into national politics unless it's relevant to EU politics. So keep that in mind when asking your, your, your question in the chat. Uh, and without further ado, well, I suggest that we start. Uh, good evening, Mr. Ushakovs. Welcome on the, on the on the channel, and uh, thank you for for accepting to do this interview with uh, with us tonight. So you heard me do this uh, this little introduction, and where where I talked about you, and I mentioned that uh, you actually I'm going to start a bit unusually with a with a bit of a personal question. So I mentioned that you are uh, Latvian Russian, uh, so you're from the Russian minority in, in in Latvia. And when I was doing a, a bit of a preparation for the interview, I I discovered that uh, you actually for for Eight years, you, you had actually no nationality after the uh, after the collapse of the of the Soviet Union. So, can you explain a, a bit to to to, to the audience uh, why for for a few, for some years you were without a nationality and well, how does it work in Latvia for for uh, on this spot for Ru Russian Latvian Russians? Good evening and thank you for inviting me for this uh, really interesting uh, format of uh, being interviewed as the member of the European Parliament. Sorry for delaying the interview for a couple of times. It was no because of uh, uh, agenda uh, back in the house. Yes, it's absolutely true. I'm uh, representing Russian speaking minority. Um, it's roughly 30 to 35 percent of overall population in Riga. Uh, it's estimated to be around 55 percent and in a couple of cities it's um close to 80. Um, but in general as you uh, already checked in on wikipedia um, Latvia is latvian state uh, national official language is latvian and after our country regained its independence back in 1991 it was um i would call it a political mistake that a number of Russian speakers, um, it was um, depending on uh, when they or their parents arrived to Latvia, they were not granted Latvian passports uh, immediately. So we have we had to go through the uh, naturalization procedure. So for me, it was a deliberate choice because I left for some time from Latvia to Denmark because I started economics, uh, my, did my master degree in economics, actually in European studies in Odense in Denmark, and then I deliberately uh, returned back home and then went for um, it was a special exam to pass in history and language which was I would say extremely primitive it was something like you had to listen to the text and answer the questions the ball is on the, on the chair or the ball is on the table 
really simple. So um, I actually passed the um, examinations and then I got like the passport. I was already a journalist at the time working for public TV. But yes, uh, it split as a um, society to a certain extent because, for instance, my parents say they didn't go through this procedure because they believe they were in favor of independence and it was kind of wrong for them to uh, make them passing any exams. And actually, they couldn't vote for me. When I was a mayor, when I was a member of the national parliament, uh, they obviously supported me as much as they could, but without uh, participating actually in election. Right now, we've got around 10% of uh, population who are so-called non-citizens, as you call them people without nationality. So officially, it's called um, non-citizens. We've got uh, them in Latvia, and we've got also them in neighboring Estonia. And, um, yeah, this is 10% of population and 35% of population are Russian speakers. So now you you, you are an MEP uh, and uh, so something that I discovered is that you, you became an MEP, but, sure, but before the election, initially you said you didn't want it to become an MEP. So what changed your mind and said, okay, in the end, I'm going to go to, to, uh, to, go to the European elections? Actually, I didn't tell that I um, didn't want to become an a MEP. I studied European studies when I was a student, so um, uh, entering European politics was pretty uh, logical on one hand. I served for three years as a member of national parliament. Then I was elected as a member of Riga City Council and I was afterwards selected for three times as a mayor. Then we had a political turmoil in 2019 and in between I left uh, the office uh, after being elected uh, as a member of the European parliament. And since that time, I served, uh, as you already mentioned, for two comedies of budget in Libya. And, and so, yeah, but you're in budget, uh, budget in, in Libya now. So uh, why did you choose this, uh, this committee in particular when, when you joined the, uh, the parliament? Well, when I joined the parliament, I uh, initially joined budget and effort. Budget was uh, uh, straightforward for me because, I mean, if you work as a mayor uh, running municipality, I mean, 90% of the job is doing budget. And Alfred, it was a logical choice for me because I was uh, I worked for Alfred when I was a member of the national parliament. And after the midterm, I decided that I uh, want to switch more for uh, liberties and uh, internal issues and security. So I moved to Libya and I'm the new member of this committee. And after entering Libya, the first file I got as a shadow was budget again. So it's kind of a, my uh, karma. So you, now you're, you're in budget. I understand that uh, as part of your, of your work in the budget committee, you, you worked on the uh, financing of uh, EU political parties and, and, and foundations. So uh, can you tell us a bit about what kind of financing are we talking about? What are the rules? Uh, what are the, the, what's the debate around that? Well, debates were actually connected as a major part of debates because right now we are dealing with um, uh, amending uh, uh, regulation. So it's not something new from the scratch. It was actually connected again to the situation with Russia and then everything going on on uh, that side of the world because um, European parties, they've got partners in the former Soviet Union and it was um, very crucial that uh, we are clear with um, donations and with membership fees being uh, collected from other countries. Um, so that was an issue. Well, frankly speaking, we didn't want, well, well we don't have uh, as European parties any partners uh, among uh, parties in Russia and Belarus, but uh, we wanted uh, this uh, regulation to be clear. We don't get money from them. Um, there were issues connected in general to donations because I, I've been told about uh, cases years before that when some European political parties received anonymous donations in hundreds of thousands of euros coming from former Soviet Caucasian republics. So these parties getting more, uh, I would say, streamlined and then clear. What was uh, important also from the very practical point of view, uh, I mean, uh, since we're talking to the people who live outside, happily outside the bubble, they probably don't know that uh, many European political parties, they've got different names uh, comparing to the names of political groups of the European Parliament. For instance, my party uh, uh, in Europe is called Party of European Socialists. In the European Parliament, we are called Socialists and Democrats. It is slightly misleading. Well, we've got very similar um, logos, obviously red color, which is uh, well recognized among all the voters of all the parties across Europe. But uh, well, we also align these regulations. There were some issues connected to national uh, regulation. But the main question to the voters will be if uh, European Council allows for transnationalists. 
if we uh, allow for transnationalists at the European Parliament elections, then it will be relevant. If there are no transnationalists, then uh, most likely majority of uh, people who live in the European Union will not actually notice any changes in any regulation with respect to European political parties. And so you just uh, mentioned that uh, the, the, uh, the push from the European Parliament and, and from others to have these transnational uh, po po political lists for, for the uh, European elections. Uh, which, when I connect that to the, to the, the, the whole debate about uh, budget, how, how would such transnational lists be financed? Would it be up to uh, the, uh, the European political parties, the SND, the EPP, Renew, or would it be up to the national party to chip in a bit of, uh, give a bit of budget to pay for the campaign of, su of such a, a transnational list? Because there would be candidates from all around Europe. Now, regulation is extremely straightforward. And that was one of our objectives, that we don't mix up national parties and national financing for national parties and their money with European parties and European money. It is extremely uh, detailed in many uh, parts of its regulation when it says, I mean, you can't even train for European money uh, members of national parties because it is regarded as the um, wrong way of supporting national politics. So uh, when we talk about European Parliament election, if we've got transnational lists, that means we, every European uh, voter will get two lists, one from national parties, and it will be something like, in, in my country, it will be less than Social Democrats, less than EPP, less than nationalists, and so on. And there will be another bunch of lists when it will be saying PES, EPP, Renew, ALDE, whatever they will be called at that time, ECR, and so on. So there will be two separate lists with two bunches of candidates. And national parties, they will be financing their campaigns from their money, like my party, Latin Social Democrats, or SPD, or, or, or any other. And PES, or EPP, will be financing their campaigns in these particular member states without mixing these budgets. Okay, so the two, the two are strictly separated so to avoid misuse. And again, again, when we go to ordinary uh, voters, they, at one point of time, I believe, especially for the first time, they will be really misled because they will get two box of lists, one with national parties, another one with probably not um, every voter in Europe is familiar with the names of European parties. If you go outside, for instance, in Riga, well, let's not mention uh, Brussels, but in any other city which is not connected that much to European Union and ask what is PES, what is EPP, you will not get uh, correct answers in the absolute majority of cases. People don't know. So it will be uh, misleading to a certain extent, but if we will continue it on a regular basis every five years, then people will get accustomed that they've got national parties and European parties. So for you, the, uh, are you skeptical about the, 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 the very concept of transnational lists, or is it for you just a matter that for the first few elections, people will not know what it is about, and but slowly they I, will no, get no, used I'm to it. I'm positive, ideologically I'm positive, but I'm very practical, and I already see there will be lots of issues to be solved. There will be lots of issues, issues we will not be able to solve during uh, at least first round of election. But, well, I mean, that's life. I mean, if you do something, you face resistance and problems. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't work. And uh, since uh, since you're still you're still part of uh, of the budget committee, one of the big uh, debates around the, the European budget is how uh, how is the EU supposed to finance itself? So right now the EU relies a lot on national contribution uh, from the, so the budget of France, of Latvia, of Germany, etc. Each writing your check to the EU, and there is a debate on the so-called own resources, the ability for the EU to finance itself. So uh, where do you think the EU could go get money to finance itself without having to rely on on uh, on the member states? In general, I believe that EU will not be able to survive without uh, further integration, especially if we talk about finances. It's inevitable. So we've got either European Union uh, being preserved or we do something else. So that's why it was so crucial uh, during COVID crisis that we ended up having NGU and we ended up having a basically federal bonds uh, financing uh, NGU. It, it was crucial that we created federal uh, debt. Uh, so to my point of view, introduction of own resources is inevitable. It is highly important, but again, that will take lots of time. 
because uh, any estimates right now on um, introducing European level taxes, for instance, for um, airlines, for uh, pollution, plastic, and financial transaction, and so on, there were estimates showing that you can, um, if you compare it to the magnitude of NGU, economy recovery fund for people who are outside uh, the bubble again and who don't know what is NGU. So the money which is supposed to be spent to um, overcome the uh, previous economic crisis, it was 750 million euros. So um, all the uh, new right now discussed own resources were estimated to uh, raise roughly 100 million euros. So it's far from being sufficient. But I believe that without introduction of first uh, European level taxes, we will not be able to go for the run, and it inevitably will face one day, probably in 10 years or in 15 years, much higher uh, uh, number of European level uh, taxes. I have a question in the chat that goes back to the uh, to the question of the transnational list. Uh, so uh, Andres is asking whether, uh, since the transnational list are linked to the EU parties, uh, so EPP, SND, etc., uh, would political parties that are not member of a, of a political group in the par in at EU level be able to have a spot on the transnational list or is it reserved for the uh, uh, for the European groups well first of all uh, let's be precise as a number of me members of the European Parliament being elected uh, through the transnational list it will be something like if I'm correct 14. So it will, it will be a very small number. Um, that's uh, um, out of 705. And we still don't know whether they will be added. So it will be 705 plus transnationalists or they will be counted in. Uh, but again, it will be a small number. It also raises questions because it will be kind of a small number of special members of the European Parliament being elected in a special procedure. Um, but again, you will have it's it's again a problem because for instance in our group we've got members from different parties some of these parties are members of the party of european socialists some are not so it will be the case that um you will have the whole bunch of different parties part of them will be also affiliated with european families some of them will have no affiliation they will participate at the national level and they will produce the 705 members of the parliament and then there will be a transnational a transnational lists. So it will be main European parties, what we've got right now. There are some certain criteria that uh, allow for wider, larger number of parties. So it probably will be, I don't know, dozen, something like 15 different European lists uh, with a very small number of candidates, again, coming from national states. Because in the majority of cases, you will have exactly the same people running on both lists. Because uh, if you have, uh, uh, for instance, from any political logic, if you've got in German, no, Germany is complicated, they've got many constituencies. If you take a country with one constituency, probably the leader of a national list will be also on the transnational list. Ah, so you could have the same name on both lists? It's not a, a mutual you are, exclusive? You are, allowed, you are allowed to be on two lists, and it makes lots of sense to be on two lists, because if you are a um, leading politician, for instance, something like, first three on the national list, um, you will not make a choice going to the transnational list, leaving your national list, because uh, you might not be elected on transnational list. You're taking lots of risk because it's only 27 candidates and most likely it will be two or three candidates from each party being elected this way. So yeah, I believe that majority of parties uh, will decide that they will send their leaders on the transnational list. And so basically it will be kind of a NBA dream team for every European party. Okay, interesting. I, I didn't know about, uh, about that. Um, moving on. Actually, uh, it was my idea that you should be allowed to be on both lists. Okay. Because again, it's, it's a very practical. Okay. Um, and, uh, besides your, your, your committees, you're a member of what is called a, an intergroup. So one, uh, one of those being the LGBTI intergroup. So the uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, uh, intersex uh, intergroup in the European Parliament. So it's a bit of a Friendship group to, to to explain very in very play uh, very uh, uh, short uh, terms uh, and uh, from what I, I've read when I when I raised that and on, on, online people have been a bit surprised by that say yeah but uh, uh, your your party apparently back home is not uh, the the most uh, straightforward when it comes to to LGBT uh, issues so they were asking but why why is this MEP 
uh, in the LGBT uh, group in Brussels, while his party back home is not uh, is not uh, necessarily uh, on the forefront when it comes to LGBT matters. So is that a personal choice? Is that something that you you see as coherent with your party position? So uh, mm. how come you said I'm going to join this intergroup? In general, um, Latin society and um, society in the Baltic states is uh, pretty conservative. It's a heritage of Soviet uh, times. Uh, it's connected to many national issues, to religious factor and aspects. So um, people are conservative. And uh, when we had um, um, the Baltic Pride uh, in Riga when I was a mayor, uh, we had a special poll, and it was um, exactly the same ratio of um, any party uh, voters supporting Pride. It was something like a three, four, five percentage points it was really low the huge difference was uh, among obviously different uh, generations but again uh, for younger people there was a huge share of those who were indifferent as for when we go for uh, elder people they were predominantly negative so in our group political group in the national parliament members of my party are split in proportions one to three roughly speaking so one quarter is um, if we use european bubble terminology is progressive Three quarters are, are conservative. It's it's a fact. I mean, this is the way my voters, voters of my party, elect members of the national parliament. So for me, it, it is crucial again from practical point of view, if we talk about these dimensions that I um, get on one hand, um, not only information but ideas, insights. What because I mean, changing legislation will be anyway inevitable. We will have to introduce uh, same marriage um, if uh, same. Um, gender marriages or any type of uh, registration of the uh, partnership, it, it, it will happen. So we have to um, go for uh, experience of other countries, not only when we talk about legal aspects, but also the way it was done politically. I also take responsibility to explain the situation with my party and with society in Latvia to LGBTI colleagues uh, uh, here in Brussels. And if you ask me about my personal uh, beliefs, yes. I believe it's absolutely wrong to mess up with the way other people live and with the way other people want to uh, do the partnership. I mean, the um, my principle is, I mean, don't really uh, um, try to bias other people because you don't like something or because you believe it's uh, it's not the way it's supposed to be according to your uh, traditions or whatever. I mean, just let other people live the way they want to live. It's it helps. Basically, that's okay. the answer. Okay, no, that's uh, that's that's very clear. Uh, uh, now let's let's talk about the uh, uh, the main issue these uh, these last few months: Ukraine, the invasion of Ukraine by uh -huh. uh, by by Russia. Uh, so, how as as a Latvian Russian, uh, how do you how do you see see the, the this invasion of Ukraine by Russia? It's a drama. It's an absolute drama, because well, for me personally, um, they can take on my. Uh, origins and so on, I have equally a uh, positive attitude both vis-a-vis -vis Russia and Russians and Ukraine and Ukrainians, whatever language they speak there. For me, uh, I mean, equally nice nations. I've been traveling a lot to Russia. I've got relatives in Russia. I've been traveling to Ukraine and I used to have some relatives in Ukraine. So, I mean, the whole fact that they are, are f it's a war. I mean, it's something uh, impossible to digest. When you see, uh, for instance, Kharkiv, as the Ukrainian cities being bombed down, we see it, it, I mean, the majority of houses over there, you know, these apartment houses they were built in Soviet times, they look exactly the same in Riga neighborhoods and in Kharkiv. I mean, houses look the same. The way cars are parked by these houses look the same. I've got the feeling that my city is bombed down. And um, then when you go further on, when you see atrocities in Bucha and Irpen, when you see uh, um, all this information and uh, reports about war crimes, and when you understand the whole fact that the problem is solved with tanks and then and, and, uh, artillery, I mean, uh, it's tough. It's something like, uh, I would use an analogy that you understand that the member of your family, your close relative or your close friend, actually is a rapist or, or, or a killer. And you have to live with this uh, first room. It is it's complicated. Mm -hmm. In Latvia, um, latest polls shows that roughly one third of the Russian speakers support Ukraine. Roughly ten percent support Russia, 
and the rest are from the sociological point of view it is because they don't have any opinion but uh, well to my my assumption would be that they are devastated they can't really uh formulate what they see because what they see on tv it just it's a horror non-stop and, and, and then you have yeah and so now uh, so the, the, the relationship between Russia and you, of course, has, has degraded. So what, what do you think the the, the, uh, the the relationship between the EU and Russia and trade as well with Russia should go? Should we, uh, I don't want to say completely interrupt trade and, and relationship with Russia, but which, should we like keep degrading this relationship or should we at some point say, OK, uh, we reach a plateau, let's let's keep uh, channels open and uh, keep some trade, etc.? Well, we are at war, basically. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, Ukraine was attacked not because it's Ukraine. It, it was a part of a larger story, in my opinion. Um, sanctions we use right now are extremely important in the medium term, in the longer term, because um, sanctions are the tool to prevent further conflicts and new wars. These sanctions are not capable to stop this war because Russia is fighting with munition, with weapons that were produced and paid by Soviet budget. I mean, it was produced 20 or 30 years ago. I mean, if they don't get any euros or dollars for months from now, they still have lots of uh, Soviet time produced artillery, old tanks, and then and, and other stuff to keep on fighting. So um, what we see with trade, we see that Russia is using trade as a weapon as well. It's not also about our willingness or capacities to buy, not to buy Russian gas or Russian oil. It's a threat that Russia is stopping selling gas and oil because they understand that they can survive for some time without the euros or dollars. That's what we face in Germany, for instance. That's what we face in Poland and Bulgaria when they refuse to pay in rubles. So it's not only our choice whether we trade with Russia or not. Russia uses it as a tool against Europe. Mm -hmm. okay, and just... uh, we'll make their choice on their own. Another part of the logic is that um, due to the sanctions, our societies and our economies are paying hundreds of billions and millions, it will be billions for the run of euros because of uh, increasing prices, because of other uh, losses to the economies. If we spend that money on providing help to Ukraine, probably that would be a lot, it would be really different. So it is tricky, but again, there is no way you can have a full-scale cultural, uh, humanitarian, economic, or business relations when you've got you've got the war. I mean, you've got um, war crimes being committed every day. I don't believe you, you should compare right now this conflict to the World War II. To me, it still reminds um, by its character, by the way it's uh, performed uh, wars in uh, former Yugoslavia conflict between Serbia, Croatia, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, um, uh, conflict like this, the way atrocities were performed, it's very similar. Um, okay. And, but, and... Uh, answering the question, uh, finally, I believe my forecast, because also I live in a country which is bordering with Russia, we will face an Iron Curtain and we will be living with Iron Curtain for years, unfortunately. And. Uh, you you represent uh, R Russian speaking uh, La Latvian. So when when you go back home, how do you explain? Okay, the EU is taking sanctions against uh, against Russia, uh, but it's not again it's not against us Russian speaking Latvian. So do, are your constituents able to to make the difference between uh, what the sanctions being made made against uh, the Russian state and them as uh, as Russian speaking uh, Latvian, or is there like a. This, this part is absolutely clear because I mean, these people, I mean, I mean, my voters, they are citizens of the European Union. They absolutely understand oh, what is imposed on Russia and what's happening in Latvia, uh, whatever neighborhood you're living with, whatever percentage of minority. Uh, what is difficult to explain to many of my voters. Um, and it cannot be explained because it's right now not about uh, the way you present arguments or information. It's the way people believe. And um, people believe in things that are rational and people believe in things that are irrational. And we just, I would say, partially survived the previous COVID crisis, which was exactly, again, about beliefs. It was not about arguments. It was not about rationale. So some people believe uh, what Russia is doing is 
horrible and sanctions are absolutely um, justified. Some people believe it's wrong. And you can say anything. I mean, whatever you present, it's just because they think so. And if you talk about Russian speakers in Latvia, it's a huge split. It's a generational split among uh, between younger people and between their parents, or more often their grandparents. It's uh, um, to some extent geographical split because there is some difference again between Russian speakers living in the capital city or Russian speakers living closer to the border. Um, it's tough. It's okay. tough. And, and when you speak to people who believe and uh, live in terms which are not about rationality, it's even tougher. And, and speaking of, of belief and uh, and the, the fact that you just said, yeah, for you, it's it's a it's a drama what's happening in uh, in uh, in Ukraine and all that. Uh, your your party back home until 2018 uh, had a, a friendship agreement with uh, Vladimir Putin's party in Russia, uh, Run Russia. So how come this uh, this uh, a friendship agreement between your party and Putin's party only came to an end in 2018 while we already had the, the uh, annexation of Crimea in, uh, in 2014. We already have a conflict in Ukraine since 2014. So why did it take so much time? Well, probably it will not be a surprise for anyone that a um, group of Russian-speaking politicians in Latvia were as optimistic. Well, optimistic is wrong word. Um, we tried to be as rationalized, for instance, our German colleagues from SPD and the whole bunch of Europeans who believe that you should try to have good relations with Russia. Um, it worked for some time. I, 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 right now I'm talking about uh, before 2014. Before 2014, when I was again in Mayor of Riga, uh, we managed to increase, uh, I would say, fantastically, uh, volume of investment coming from Russia, from Belarus, from uh, uh, Ukraine, from other former Soviet uh, republics. Uh, we increased number of tourists something like four times, and uh, we had that one period of time that 31% of tourists coming to Riga, they, they came from Russia. We, it was really good. We had festivals, we had lots of uh, cultural activities, uh, transport and stuff. And uh, we had lots of um, contacts with uh, regions, Moscow, St. Petersburg, other regions. And as you would imagine yourself, every single governor, every single man in Russia, they were represented, uh, representatives of United Russia. So having this uh, agreement was extremely helpful for the city because you go, you got uh, new contracts, you got new tourists, and it, it worked. In 2014, we put it on hold. And then on 20, uh, it was 2018, yes, you, you are correct, we fully ceased any cooperation because it was kind of a basically we just it was a constatation of the fact because uh, everything was on hold since 2014. We made uh, I, after the beginning of the conflict I traveled once to Moscow and that was the last time. I haven't been there since 2014. Okay interesting. Uh, another question from the chat uh, on, on Ukraine. So the question is, how far do you think Latvians are willing to support sanctions uh, with the chance of further escalation, especially in the Baltic uh, becoming more probable? Well, I mean, what do you mean by escalation? Do you mean an economic or military escalation? Because uh, it's a threat from both sides. I don't believe in high risks of military escalation. But again, I might be wrong. I didn't believe also in the war in Ukraine. But um, right now, it's not only about belief, it's also about estimates when you see losses and hardship of Russian army uh, is uh, taken in Ukraine, probably it improves your chances not being attacked military if you live in the Baltics. But I mean, there can be anything else. I mean, quasi uh, attacks, uh, cyber security, uh, economical, uh, ecological and whatsoever. So I mean, it's not easy. So when Lithuania right now is implementing the policy of uh, sanctions with respect to transit to Kaliningrad region, well, I would really love to wish them good luck because they are, I mean, our closest neighbors. And I, actually, I was going to, my next question was about uh, Lithuanian policy towards Kaliningrad. So they, they, they implemented uh, EU sanctions against some uh, Russian products and, and, and merchandise. And so they blocked the trans transit of these uh, merchandises to Kaliningrad, so the, the, rancher, the, the Russian enclave uh, between the Baltics and, the, uh, and, and Poland. So do, do you think that it is a justified move by Lithuania, or do you think it's a bit of a, 
of a provocation made to, to, to Russia. Russia was already reacted, say that it, uh, it was illegal in their view and that there would be uh, retaliation, so to say. I believe Lithuania is following the regulation the way it was adopted. Because, I mean, if you cannot uh, move certain goods across Europe, you cannot move them. And Kaliningrad is not an enclave. I mean, you've got, uh, uh, well, sophisticated, but you still can fly there somehow through the North Pole. And um, the Baltic Sea is open. So, I mean, you can deliver any goods by sea or by, by uh, planes. Yeah, so the, it's not a, there's no blockade uh, no, as no, Russia. No, no, it's a, it's a complication in in logistics, but I mean everything connected to sanction is complicating the logistics as well. And speaking of the of, of the Baltic state, so we know that uh, Vladimir Putin has said repeatedly that he considers the fall of the Soviet Union to be the uh, the most terrible geopolitical event uh, of the second half of the 20th century. And recently, he has even said that the independence of Ukraine, but also of the Baltic state was pretty much a, uh, a mistake and that your country should basically not exist. Uh, so how does that make you feel like to, to have Vladimir Putin saying that your country should not exist, it's not legitimate to exist, so bearing in mind that you have both the Russian descent and the Latvian descent? Well, generally speaking, um, human history suggests none of the empires managed to uh, survive forever. I don't believe... Uh, even despite the fact that I'm an ethnic Russian, that Russia is something special and in case the Russian Empire will stay forever. It's wrong. It will not happen this way. And it's really important for every nation if you represent in your past an empire is the way you go through this transformation. I mean, Netherlands, other countries, they've got fantastic experience coming from colonial and an imperial uh, background till becoming a full-scale democracies. So Russia still has lots of things to be done after the empires uh, collapsed finally. And um, going back to my previous answer, what happens right now in Ukraine from the military point of view, well, most likely um, Russia has no capacity to uh, endanger at this moment other neighbors. But again, they've got nukes, so that uh, makes sometimes things different. Okay, interesting. Um... Another question that I that I had from, from people was, uh, we know that there's been since the beginning of the war in Ukraine about two three million of uh, of Ukraine refugees who came who came into uh, uh, into the EU because of the war uh, the war initiated by uh, by Russia. So, what do you think these uh, the EU should do with uh, Ukrainian refu refugees? Uh, they, they are being welcome, etc. But should they be offered a special uh, status or should they be treated as any kind of uh, other refugees? What we see right now is that probably Ukrainian refugees, especially in Eastern European countries, are treated um, significantly better than refugees uh, previous years. So my position is that we have to keep this level. And it was absolutely dramatic that, uh, literally speaking, six months ago, we had refugees, women with children, on the border Belarus and, Russia, uh, and Latvia, and Latvian border guards forced them to stay during winter in the forest because we just didn't allow anyone to enter. And they were people from Afghanistan, from Iraq, from other countries fleeing from the same war crimes what we see right now in Ukraine, especially if we talk about Afghanistan, where West actually, the West actually, uh, I mean, it was slightly disgraceful the way Kabul was left with all our allies and people working for Western countries. So um, we have to keep the level we uh, deal with Ukrainian refugees right now for any other refugees coming to the European Union, first of all. It should be kind of a wretched effect. And second of all, um, if you, um, we, we should introduce uh, more or less uh, United Standards for refugees the way they are received in member states. And since we will have to introduce the standards, also the money and financing should be also um, introduced in order to help uh, certain member states in certain circumstances. So, uh, still on, on the discussion of the refugees, if I understand you, you, you see that there was a bit of a double standard in the way that Ukrainian and other refugees, Afghanistans, uh, African Syrians, etc., were, were, were treated. Uh, so, but uh, how do you uh, explain or uh, yeah, explain or identify the, the reason why uh, Poland, for instance, who has been very 
vocal that they do not want any refugees uh, during, during the refugee crisis in, uh, in, uh, in 2015 and so on, that suddenly, oh, well, it's Ukraine, let's, let's open all the doors. Uh, wh why should Ukraine be treated better in their, in, in their view uh, compared to, to others? It's, it's, it's human nature. I mean, everything that happens to your friends or your relatives, you feel much closer and you feel that pain, I would say, uh, much better than, uh, for instance, if something is happening to people you don't know. I don't, I don't say it's good or bad, it's, it's just a fact. Mm -hmm. I mean, in 2016, 2015, uh, Riga tried to prepare itself for the influx of refugees. And something like 60 or 70 refugees altogether came. I mean, 60, 70 full point, not 1,000. It's the first time we've got refugee, refugees in general. Right now, we've got in between 20 and 30,000 Ukrainians living in Latvia because you can't really count them uh, precisely because many of them are staying with their friends, with their relatives. So there is no centralized register. But if you talk about 20 or 30,000, uh, Latvia is a country of less than 2 million. So you have to multiply it by a factor of 10 to get it, for instance, comparable to the uh, Polish situation. Mm -hmm. And in case of Poland, it would be something like 200,000. It's a lot for our country. It's, it's a financial burden. It's, it's an experience for our nation. And again, I would like to see this experience uh, if we will have the um, necessity to use it again or for, with refugees from other nations to, to keep the same level of attitude. And so do, do you believe that uh, in these countries where there was a bit this, uh, uh, these stereotypes about refugees uh, from, from uh, Syria, etc., and so people were reluctant to get uh, refugees from, from outside their, their country, with now the, 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 the influx of Ukrainian refugees that everyone welcome, do you think it will uh, uh, ease in the future the relationship that these populations have with refugees in general, also with Syrians, with Afghanis, etc. You think it's, okay, there is the case of Ukrainian, and then they put completely separately the case of uh, Syrian, Afghanis, and, uh, and other people from outside of Europe, let's say. I unfortunately believe, uh, even despite my dreams, it won't happen, because again, going back to human nature, uh, this tragedy in Ukraine is happening, if it occurs about Latvia, with people who we know pretty well I mean, lots of Latvians have been to Ukraine, they've got friends there, they've got probably relatives, they travel there, they work there, they've got business relations or whatsoever. And even despite the fact that the magnitude of strategy in Syria and Ukraine is probably uh, uh, exactly the same, we don't have friends or, or, or people we know in Syria. You can't relate, yeah, people can't relate. Because of distance, because of distance, mm -hmm. that's, that's the whole point. And yes, people will keep on being... Um, behaving uh, the way they behaved for centuries. Uh, and so another debate uh, still related to Ukraine is whether it should uh, join the, uh, the EU. We know that uh, from tomorrow, the, uh, the EU uh, head of state and government are gathering in Brussels. Uh, actually, well, no, Wednesday, it's tonight that they're gathering in, uh, in, in Brussels. And one point of discussion will be whether Ukraine should become a candidate country. So first, do you think Ukraine should join the, uh, should join the EU? And if yes, how long do you think it will take? For them to, to join there is no way a uh, european union can allow itself to say no it's just kind of it's impossible it would be at this uh, stage of the war it would be uh, i would say comparable to full betrayal um second of all we uh, when european union will um promise candidate status and uh, eu membership to ukraine we have to keep in mind the mistake that was done uh, with respect to NATO. Quite a few European politicians or, or even European leaders were extremely straightforward in promising Ukraine NATO membership someone in the future. And this promise was the first one to be dropped during the first days of the war. Okay, if you want to save your lives, if you want to have some peace, and if you want to be, to be neutral without uh, becoming NATO members, it's okay with us. Um, if we start after making this highly political decision to grant candidacy to Ukraine, and the next day we start very detailed questioning about, for instance, rule of law or corruption or things like this, 
On one hand, it is absolutely reasonable because that's the things we, we, we request from the Western Balkan states, for instance. And again, uh, Western Balkan states, they uh, experienced exactly the same atrocities what people in Ukraine face right now during the war with Russia. So we shouldn't be discriminating, uh, for instance, uh, Montenegro or other uh, former Yugoslav republics uh, um, granting other countries because of the current war uh, faster tracks than others. But again, um, when the war is over and when the European Union starts discussing uh, EU membership for Ukraine much more seriously than now, most likely politicians will not be talking about rule of law. They will be talking about common agricultural policy. They will be talking about adhesion. And because the magnitude of agricultural land in Ukraine is larger than in Poland, because people in Europe, pretty often, they don't really think, is they don't even realize the size of Ukraine. It is larger than Poland, it's larger than Spain. It's huge. And after full membership, it will be a huge challenge the way European budget will be designed in general, common agricultural policy, cohesion, and so on. And when European politicians will start saying publicly, look, I'm not sure that we can afford ourselves to take Ukraine in, and we go for decades because of this issue, that can be a full threat again for the European stability. But again, that will be problems that are inevitable, that are solvable, and understanding the uh, range of these problems is important and crucial, but right now the only answer should be yes to candidacy. And again, um, when we abstract from all the problems, I truly, I would, I would love to see Ukraine, I would like to see Belarus, or Moldova being a full members of the European Union together with the Baltic states. Oh, inter interesting. Uh, and also, I'm, su I'm supporting also, even despite the geographical uh, remoteness, I also support the uh, membership for Georgia, for instance. Okay, oh, inter interesting, because, uh, yeah, indeed, Georgia also uh, made act of, of, of candidacy, but it's, like, pretty far away from uh, from, uh, from from the, the rest of Europe, so... be a real enclave, yeah. Uh, and, and so the question, one of the criteria for, for to join the EU is being part of uh, of uh, of, the Euro of Euro Europe. So would, do we still consider Georgia to be part of Europe, or is it more like uh, uh, Asia at this point, minor uh, minor Asia? Asia. No, no. I mean, the way I was taught geography in school says it's Europe. Okay. Uh, and uh, we're reaching slowly the, the end because I know that you have to to go a bit before uh, nine. Uh, not the final question yet, but we're getting close. Uh, if you could change, you, you can snap your fingers and change anything about the EU, the way it works, etc. What do you change and why? You mean one thing? And one the thing is, uh... Yeah, the, the one thing you would change. You can snap your finger, you change it. Well, I probably would fight with majority voting. I mean, we have to introduce a normal way decisions are done. If it's only unanimous uh, decision-making process, uh, we are stuck. E there are, must be uh, areas when you uh, must make decisions uh, only unanimously in the sake of uh, unity. But there should be lots of areas when you just should be allowed to vote and allow the majority of European nations to decide. And so which topic would you keep uh, under unanimity? Military issues, probably. I, I'm, I'm actually in favor of the European uh, army being a part, obviously, a pillar of NATO, not uh, as an uh, opponent or uh, competitor, but as a part of NATO. But again, military issues should be a like unanimity. Uh, but again, if we talk about foreign policy, there should be some questions where you should be allowed to vote without uh, other member states having the right of veto everything. Okay. And a uh, final question uh, for, for, for you tonight. Uh, where do you stand on, on the debate on a federal European Union? Are you in favor? Are you against? Are you on the fence? No, I'm, I'm in favor of pretty much. Uh, I presume the answers I provided you for your questions are in line with my uh, idea that uh, Europe should be much more federal. And again, I mean, uh, it's not the by, uh, about the way people like it or not, or you can provide arguments it's about beliefs some say well we've got really nice national state we don't want other unions to mess up with everything we've got 
but in the modern world with the current level of globalization i mean it's not about only computers it's also about viruses that are traveling around the world uh, as what we have seen um yes it must be federal much more federal okay very clear um so uh we reached the the, the end of my question that i that i had for you uh before before we go uh you, before you go uh if there was one message that people should re remember from uh, from tonight what would be the message <laughs> well i just had a discussion uh with my followers on facebook we had a Euro barometer polls uh, results being published saying that 62% of left hand population believe EU is a good thing and only 5 or 8% believe it's bad. And I was debating with the followers uh, who are not that pro European. And my message was that if Brussels, European Union, for instance, give money to member states, and member states are not extremely effective, for instance, the way they spend this money, it's not the fault of the European Union. So stop blaming EU and Brussels for everything you do wrong back home with your own hands. I mean, European Union is not in charge of our own mistakes and our own wrongdoing. Uh, European Union provides opportunities which are used or which are missed. And whether we are using these opportunities or missing them, it's again, it's our responsibility, not responsibility of Ursula von der Leyen or Borrell or uh, Metzola. Well, that's very clear. Uh, thank you very much, Nisa Ushakov, for taking the time of answering our question. Chat, make sure, make sure to thank him. You can uh, follow him on Twitter. You have his handle just below the video feed. Uh, so thanks again, Mr. Ushakov. Uh, I wish you a very good evening. I hope you enjoy your, your first experience on, the, on, on Twitch. Uh, and yeah, I, will, I hope Everything to see you in the future. The time. Thank yeah, well, thank you for that there, there's always a first time. So uh, thanks again. And uh, chat, stay with me. We're going to start the debriefing. Bye, Mr. Ushakov. Thank you. All right, let's do this. Let me close Zoom. All right, so tell me what you thought. Uh, in the meantime, I uh, I gather my notes. Uh, I couldn't react on the spot, but uh, thanks for the red, Karim. I don't know if you're still around. Let me check. No, I don't see you in, the, in there, but yeah, thanks for the red anyway. Uh, and I hope that uh, your, your, your own viewers... Uh, uh, Spanish speaking, sorry, I don't speak Spani Spanish. Uh, enjoy the, the end of our interview, of my interview with uh, Ladian MEP uh, Nils Ushakov, uh, which was, I, I think, pretty pretty interesting. And given again, I mean, I mentioned that repeatedly, he's from the uh, uh, the, the Latvian Russian uh, minority. So he, he explained that at the at the beginning. So there's a, a part of, uh, of the Latvian population that is uh, of Russian descent because back during the Soviet Union, uh, uh, Russia, had actually de facto colonized a uh, part of uh, of the of the Baltic state. They are they are implanting in the countries uh, a number of Russian uh, Russian uh, families. And after the collapse of the uh, the Soviet Union, uh, these Russians well they they, they stayed behind uh, to 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 an extent. Uh, and uh, they, there was a whole issue on uh, what to uh, what what to do uh, uh, about them. Uh, Bit too liberal on migration policy, but in good points otherwise. Ah. I know, I know, uh, Andrews. That uh, you, usually you, you find them too liberal, but uh, yeah, it was it was interesting. It was it was interesting. Uh, the, the stateless thing. I, th I thought it was uh, it was interesting. So during, I think, for eight years, from 1991 to 1998, uh, he was stateless. So meaning that he had formally no nationality. He was not Latvian. Uh, he was not Russian. He had no nationality because uh, when the, the Latvia and generally speaking the the the, the Baltic states. Uh, became independent again after the collapse of the Soviet Union. They decided that uh, to get the the, uh, the nationality, the Latvian nationality, they would look at the the, the family, the, the the family of citizens. Say. And so basically, they were saying, okay, if your family, uh, your parents were of uh, Latvian nationality, were Latvian, then you get the Latvian nationality. But if they were Russians. Then you don't get the, uh, the the Latvian nationality, or you have to pass a test, uh, uh, language, history, etc. Et and so for a number of years, uh, there there is uh, there was and still is uh, a number of uh, of Russian speaking uh, minority there, which varies depending on the on the, on the cities and the region. He said that uh, in Riga, it's more or less fifty percent of the population who is uh, Russian speaking. And so these people were not, uh, didn't have a, a, a nationality. They were not uh, g g getting the Latvian nationality. They were not passing the exam. So he mentioned, like, for instance, his parents, they couldn't vote for him at the election because they didn't get the, the, the Latvian 
nationality. And I was reading, an, I, I saw an article uh, a, a while back, uh, uh, actually, funnily enough, uh, a Spanish article I couldn't find anywhere else, uh, that was saying that uh, Leto, 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 it's not uh, Latvia, no, Lithuania, I think, had the highest uh, number per capita of stateless people in the world. And yeah, like you're saying, Andrews, uh, it's still the case that a lot of Russians in the Baltics are stateless. They don't, they don't have the 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 the, the, uh, the Latvian or the Baltic na nationality. So that's uh, still a, a pretty specific thing uh, from from the Baltic uh, uh, because of the the big population, the big Russian-speaking uh, 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 population there. So that I thought that was uh, pretty interesting as a as a perspective. Uh, otherwise, something that I thought was interesting to, to, to mention, so he said, oh yeah, so he's in the budget committee and in the, the, the Libé committee, so the public, the, the public liberties committee, so to say, and he said, oh well, initially I was in budget and the uh, foreign affairs committee and I switched. So how does it work? Uh, because MEPs, when they arrive in the parliament, uh, they have to choose a committee, they, they have the obligation to choose a, to choose a committee, uh, it's the product of negotiations at, at, uh, between the groups and uh, between the, the members of each delegation. Because, for instance, in the Budge Committee, so let's say there is uh, 40 seats in uh, the, the Budge Committee. I, I don't know how many there are in reality, but let's say 40. Uh, you will have, I don't know, 12 that will go to DPP, uh, 10 that will go to the SND, and so on and so forth. So it reflects the size of the political groups in the European Parliament. And so... The socialists, let's say, they have 10 seats, and so they need to decide who among the 100 and something uh, SND MEPs will go in budge. Uh, and so there they are negotiations between the French delegation, the German delegation, the Latvian delegation to say, okay, my MEPs uh, want to be in budge, but my, uh, my, um, this one wants also. And so they, they're basically trading seats. They say, okay, uh, I will grant you a seat in uh, in budge, but in exchange, you need to give up a seat in AFET because I have one of my members who want to go in AFET, etc. Et so there's a lot, being of a mandate, there's a lot of negotiations within the groups to decide where MPs end up. And so usually you will have, two, uh, an MEP will have two committee, one main and one substitute. And out of the two, one will be the one that they chose and one will be pretty much where they can end up following the following the negotiation. And so in this case, he was in budget and in AFET. And uh, at, the, at the half of the mandate, so in this case, it was in January 2022, uh, you reshuffle. There is a general reshuffle in the parliament, meaning that all the jobs that people, have, all the positions that people have at the beginning of the mandate they, uh, you restart everything. So people who were vice president or president of a committee, they stop being in it and there is a new election to decide who is chair of committees, who is uh, vice president of committees and so on and so forth. And there's also the possibility for MEPs to change committees. So in this case, he left the AFED committee, so the, the, the foreign affairs committee, and he went to uh, the, the Libé uh, committee at the mid mandate. So that's something that usually uh, at at mid mandate. Uh, so after two years and a half, there is a shuffle, reshuffle of the cards uh, of uh, of uh, in the European Parliament with MEPs uh, changing position, changing committees depending on the, depending on the interest, depending on whether there is room. This uh, this kind of things. Uh, but yeah, just to, to to explain how MEPs can move from uh, from committees to committees, and then they usually stay the same until the end of the mandate. Uh, something that we discussed was how the EU finance uh, political parties and, and political groups, so that's uh, uh, something that he, he works specifically uh, specifically on. So as you mentioned, so you have your national party. Uh, so for instance, in France, we have uh, uh, Renaissance, we have uh, Parti Socialiste. Uh, in Spain, you have uh, uh, the, the you have Podemos, you have uh, the Parti Popular, etc., etc. So you have your national party, but then... Uh, Above this, there is the European Party, something that you barely ever hear about. Um, so it's, let's say, all the uh, conservative parties around Europe that will ally themselves in one party, political party, which is the EPP, all the socialist parties that will ally themselves in the socialist party, European socialist party, and so on and so forth. So it's the big, this big alliance of national party, and then... Uh, you have the political groups in the parliament, which are a different thing. But uh, for the sake of, of, of understanding, 
we're talking about the European parties, the, the EU-wide uh, political parties. And so these parties can get financing from the European Union to help them finance their European activities so that uh, citizens hear about uh, what these parties stand for, what they do, uh, finance uh, Congress when, uh, so that members of national parties can meet, discuss uh, about European issues, etc., etc. And uh, what happened uh, quite a few time, uh, years ago uh, was that European parties would get anonymous donations, big anonymous donations coming from Russia, from Caucasian countries, etc., etc. Uh, you, there, there was uh, cases where I, th I think it was the far right party was that was getting directly financing from uh, from uh, from Russia, not the Russian state, but uh, uh, a lot of money coming from uh, from Russia. And so there were uh, worries within the EU saying, "Oh shit, uh, we are having uh, extra European uh, interests." that are financing our parties, and so they are trying to influence uh, what, what our European parties are doing, and so you could have, uh, uh, you, you, you could have potential for corruption. So they, they, there was this, uh, uh, this whole work being done about to put a framework about how European parties can be financed, what are the rules, what are the thresholds, so to avoid abuses. So that's something that he was working on, and something that I did not anticipate was uh, the, the link with transnationalists. So, uh, in the uh, in the European elections, so you vote right now. Uh, in last time you voted, so in 2019, you only had lists from your own member state, from your own political party. So uh, if you were in France, you had a list by one list per political party. You had the list from uh, Republicain, one list from uh, from uh, René, uh, LREM, etc., etc. If you were in in Germany, you had uh, depending on your for each lender, so each region of Germany, you had one list for the CDU, one list for the Greens, one list for that. So it was the national party that were making their own list of potential MEPs and people were voting in favor of that. But what was observed is that because of that, people do... Got here on the internet of the interview, probably will watch... Okay, yeah, definitely do, do watch the, the VOD. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I will discuss a bit uh, the, the, the Latvian bit. I, I finished the part about the, the transnational election, but yeah, I, I will talk a bit about the, 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 uh, the Latvian bit uh, because the preparation of the interview was a bit uh, spicy, let's say. Uh, but anyway, uh, the transnationalists. So the problem with the current way elections are being made is that, of course, people vote because of national politics. Uh, in uh, At least in France, for instance, people no were not voting because there was an EU... Uh, EU uh, problems or EU issue, they were voting because, well, they like uh, uh, the conserv the National Conservative Party, they, they like uh, the National Socialist Party, etc., etc. Uh, however, uh, and so the sol one solution that is uh, that was pushed by the European Parliament and by others is this idea of the transnational list. So the idea that on top of the national list still made by national parties, you would have one list that is composed not only of French MEPs, German MEPs, Spanish MEPs, etc., but a list made of candidates from all around the EU. So uh, you would have on the same list, you would have a French, you would have a German, you would have a Spanish, you would have a Latvian, etc., etc. And so each European party would present its list. So you would have uh, let's say in, in Spain, I, I'm sorry, I have a focus on Spain because I, I'm still processing the, 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 the rate from Karim. Uh, you would have the list from uh, Parti Popular and then you have in parallel the list of the EPP, which is the European party to which Parti Popular belongs to. Same thing for the Socialists, same thing for the Greens. And so you would, uh, uh, electors would have to vote twice, one for the national party, national list, and once for the transnational uh, list, so the, the the EPP list would have one Spanish, one German, etc., etc. And so it's a, it's a bit confusing for for people. He said in, in himself, uh, it's like you you're right, Andrews. It's a bit of a replacement of the the so-called Spitzen candidate system. The Spitzen candidate system, brilliant name. I don't know why everyone decided to keep the uh, the, the 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 German name, but that's why that's why it is. Uh, the idea of the Spitzen candidate was that the head or the leader of each political group uh, would say, okay, if my party wins the election, I will be the one becoming 
the president of the European Commission because the president of the European Commission must be of the same political party that won the election. So in this case, uh, the, the only time the Spitzenkandidat system was actually put in place, it was in 2014. So in 2014, each party, each uh, so you had the EPP, the Socialists, the Greens, the GUE, uh, and the ECR, uh, and Aldi as well, they, each of them said, okay, we're going to we're gonna uh, elect someone who will be our candidate for the uh, po the job of European uh, Commission. And so, if our party wins, this one will be the council. The member state must give him the job. And so, in 2014, it was the EPP that won the most uh, seats in the European Parliament. And so, it became it's the EPP candidate who was Jean Claude Juncker, so Luxembourgish guy, uh, who was pushed by the Parliament and the council decided that he would become the uh, the president of the European Commission. But in 2019, uh, member states changed their mind because they didn't like the fact that uh, Juncker was uh, independent, too independent from the council uh, and all that. So they said, well, fuck the, the, the Spencer candidate system. Uh, we're going to decide who is uh, the, the, the president of the commission. And so they decided, like, uh, they decided to put Ursula von der Leyen, uh, who is not the Spitzer candidate of the EPP. So she is EPP, but she was not the candidate of the EPP. The candidate of the EPP was uh, the leader of the EPP, Manfred Weber. But the member states said, well, we don't want Manfred Weber. We're going to put Ursula von der Leyen. And that's it. And so that was a bit the death of the Spitzer candidate system. And like Andrew is saying, the parliament is trying to push the, uh, the transnational list as a bit of a replacement to the, to the Spitzer candidate system to still have this form of EU-wide... Uh, way of doing European elections, even if it's li like the, uh, like uh, MP Ushakov was saying, it's doubtful whether people will understand the, the system from the, from the get go, but well, uh, you have to, you have to start somewhere. Uh, what else do I have? Uh, intergroups. Uh, so he's part of the LGBT intergroup. And so he explained that, yeah, uh, his political party uh, back home is not uh, very much a, a big fan of, uh, uh, of LGBT, but well, he belongs to the faction within uh, within his party that believes that its uh, LGBT rights need to be defended. So that's he said, okay, that's that's why I, I joined this uh, LGBT intergroup. So the LG intergroups are uh, it's an official, let's say, friendship group uh, that is dedicated to one topic. So you have in this case all M MEPs from all the political groups, all the nationality that group together. Uh, together and say, okay, we're going to work together on the topic of LGBT uh, issues to push the agenda of, uh, of LGBT, uh, discuss among us, etc., etc. So it's an official process. You know, at the beginning of the mandate, you have a whole procedure to uh, decide what, uh, how many uh, intergroups will there be, uh, because there's a only there can be only a limited number of, uh, of intergroups, and each intergroup that, that is created officially can get... Uh, an official status, it gets uh, financing from the parliament, it gets a uh, staff, so it, it gets a number of uh, of logistic uh, logistics uh, facilitation from the from the parliament to be able to function. And so there's a big race at the beginning of the mandate with uh, MEPs trying to decide, wanted to push their own issue to become an intergroup. So you have intergroups on the uh, on the climate change, on uh, on LGBT. You have uh, one on. Uh, I think on poverty, but I'm not certain. There is one on uh, wine and food, basically. So that you have a bunch of random topics uh, that that, uh, that have uh, an intergroup and in which MEPs uh, collaborate together uh, as part of this friendship group. But it's not a committee; they don't make law or anything. It's it's really a friendship group. Uh, it's it's an influence group within the parliament. Uh, well, uh, yeah, and going back to, to, sorry, what we were saying, Demos, uh, yeah, the preparation of this interview was a bit hectic because I went, as usual, on, on Reddit to prepare the interview. So I, I said to people, okay, uh, uh, I'm doing this interview with uh, this Latvian MEP, so I go on the Latvian uh, Reddit sub and say, okay, guys, this is happening. Uh, if you want to suggest questions, uh, do so. I will I will pick, uh, pick among your suggestions and uh, you help me prepare my interview. Uh, and to say that I had a backlash was an understatement. Uh, you, I mean, people are, are not necessarily fans of uh, when I do advertisement for promotion and uh, 
of my streams on on their national board. They don't know where, who I am. They don't know where I come from. And suddenly you have these guys say, "Oh well, I'm 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 doing an interview with a, a your MEP for suggest questions." So sometimes they, I don't get a, a a nice welcome. But in this case, it was a bit intense because they were like, "Oh yeah, uh, he comes from this uh, this party uh, who is uh, uh, represents uh, Latvian Russians, uh, so he defends only the interests of Russians." Blah blah blah. So there was a a big backlash because he's, he's Latvian Russians, also because of his involvement in a number of scandals back home, uh, which I will not get, get, get into because that's besides the scope of uh, of the interview. But yeah, I, I got... Uh, it was pretty intense. I, I think that's the most... Uh, the biggest backlash I had from a, from a national uh, a sub in the preparation of that, notably because of this all... Uh, uh, he represents uh, a Russian-speaking uh, uh, community. I, the people were telling me, oh... Uh, don't go advertise your thing. The ear go on the on the sub uh, subreddit of Russia because he's Russian. Blah 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 blah. So it was a bit intense to say the to say the least uh, to prepare for, to prepare things. And also, like uh, when I was doing my stream on Monday, I had people from the sub say, "Oh well, are you really going to ask questions to to this guy?" Uh, like you're saying on the on the sub. So it was like, okay, it, it was a bit weird to to, to prepare. In the end, it worked out well. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to get insulted on, 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 the, on the subreddit afterwards, but well, that's part of the job. Uh, I did my inter the interview with the same standard as I, as I do usually. Uh, I ask difficult questions uh, if, if they need to be asked. And I don't think, I mean, uh, I wouldn't call it cancel culture, but it's a, it's a specific thing also to, to, to Latvia. I think the, 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 in Baltic state, the relationship between the, the the, the, the Latvians uh, speaking, the Estonian speaking, and the Russian speaking uh, community can be a bit difficult. So I would say it's it's not cancel culture. It's a it's a Latvian Estonian Baltic uh, uh, national issue. I would I would say more than anything. But uh, uh, it was a bit intense. Uh, but hopefully, I hope I I didn't. I, someone called me a soapbox. I hope I, my interview was not too much of a soapbox or that I gave him a, a, a free ride. But anyway. Uh, it will be up to Latvians like uh, like uh, Demos to 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 give me a feedback on that on whether I was it was a, a useful interview or not. Um, what else did we discuss? Uh, well, speaking of ah, Kaliningrad, yes, uh, I actually prepared something for that. Okay, so what is Kaliningrad? Uh, Kaliningrad is this is the it's an enclave just there. It's a, it's a small enclave, and this is Russia actually. So here you have Europe. You have Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland. So all that members of the European Union. You have Russia. Uh, can you actually see? Yeah, you can see. So you have Russia here, uh, Moscow. And you have here this bit of land that is called Kaliningrad, which is also Russian territory, right in the middle of, uh, of the EU. So it's because of the after the collapse of the, of the Soviet Union, Kaliningrad remained. There was a deal between Poland, Lithuania, and, and Russia to, to maintain the, 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 this territory, but it's actually Russian territory uh, and an important military uh, place. I mean, for, for the longest time. Oh, shit. Uh, I have my thing that uh, left. Oh, there better. Uh, what was I saying? Uh, it was probably best that you are French neutral as possible. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, yeah, okay. After, of course, watch the VOD and uh, give me a feedback. That's always interesting. So yeah, that's Kaliningrad. Kaliningrad, for the longest of time, was pretty much a, only a military base. You have uh, you have the headquarter of the uh, the, the Russian Baltic uh, fleet. So the, the the Russian Baltic Sea uh, fleet is based in in Kaliningrad. Uh, it was impossible to enter the, enter the place, etc., etc. So it was. Pretty much a black box until until recently. Uh, it's very, very, very suspected that Russia has uh, nukes stationed uh, in in Kaliningrad, even if they did they deny it. But well, you, you see that there is this bit of Russia right in the middle of the EU. And one thing that is interesting is this place. So you see, this is the border between Poland and Lithuania. This is the only uh, terrestrial uh, link between let's say continental EU and the Baltic state. If you don't, if you remove that, Russia, Belarus, Russia. So the Baltic state will become an enclave. This is called the uh, Suvalki uh, Corridor. So it's this place that goes from Kaliningrad to, uh, to Belarus, basically. And so there is a big geostrategic interest about that, because, around that because this is like the, uh, I don't want to say lifeline, but a link between Belarus and, and, and Russia. 
but also the only link between the Baltic state and and Poland. And of course, this has a big geostrategic uh, importance because if, let's say, Russia was to connect the uh, connect Kaliningrad with Belarus, it would completely cut the Baltic state from the rest of the, uh, the rest of the EU, which. I think you will admit is a bit of a strategic problem. Uh, even even if you have uh, to the north, you still have Finland, Sweden, uh, and Denmark through 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 the sea. But that's a bit of a of a of a problem. And so Lithuania uh, decided uh, actually as of uh, yesterday to implement uh, EU sanctions that prevents uh, that applies to to uh, uh, to certain merchandise or certain goods that are the sub. Let's say high tech goods. They can't, European high tech goods cannot go into Russia anymore, let's say, to simplify things. And so Lithuania said, okay, in application to that, I will control, I will do checks on goods that go to Kaliningrad from Lithuania, which is a big chunk of the, of the, of the border. Because, of course, you want to, if Russia wants to send something to Kaliningrad, it goes through Lithuania, most likely. And so Lithuania said, we're going to do checks uh, and we're going to prevent these, uh, these goods from entering uh, Kaliningrad. And so, of course, uh, Russians were pissed off, uh, very, very pissed off, and said that it was a blockade, uh, that it was illegal because uh, uh, Russia has a specific uh, deal between with Poland, Lithuania, uh, and I think Latvia, but I'm not sure, but for sure Lithuania and Poland, to allow the circulation of goods and people between Kaliningrad and uh, Russia. And they say, oh, it's a violation of the deal, uh, of the treaty between us. Uh, it's terrible. We're going to reach a bit of it, etc., etc. But these days, Kalininga is a bit of a hotspot, politically. Uh, the commission has backed Lithuania. They said, no, Lithuania has, uh, is implementing the EU sanctions. They are right. Uh, Russians are wrong to say that it's a, it's a blockade. It's not a blockade. Uh, MEP Ushakov uh, said that it was in no way a blockade or whatever. So yeah, the, the commission is backing Lithuania there, but Kaliningrad is a bit of a hot spot uh, these days, even if uh, the, the MEP said, uh, said it that given the invasion uh, of Ukraine, the military uh, the, the military state of, of Russia that is, let's say, struggling in, in, in Ukraine, he says that it's unlikely that uh, Russia would open a second front and trying to invade, let's say, uh, uh, the Baltic state uh, from Kaliningrad, which, I mean, let's be honest, it's it would be borderline the, the, the beginning of World War III because uh, the Baltic states are part of NATO. That would trigger uh, the so-called Article 5 of NATO, which is the, mu the, the mutual defense clause uh, of, of the, the alliance. So to summarize, it's uh, an attack on one of us is uh, an attack on all of us. So let's say if Lithuania is attacked by Russia, in theory, uh, under Article 5, all the members of NATO, so most of the European Union, but also this little country here, okay, can you see it? Yeah, you can see it. Uh, would have to help Lithuania and basically declare war on Russia as well. So, pretty much the beginning of uh, World War III uh, there. So, unlikely to, to, to happen given the, the, the state of uh, uh, the military state of, of Russia, and uh, unless uh, he becomes completely nuts. But anyway, uh, I, I thought it was interesting to, to put. Uh, a, a bit of context around Kaliningrad, where it is and why people are, are, are talking about it and why it is uh, very important uh, strategically. I'm going back to the discussion slide. Okay. Uh, what did we talk about? Oh, yes, refugees. Uh, so we talked about Ukraine refugees. He was pretty open about the fact that, uh, uh, unfortunately, for according to him, like there is a double standard uh, for... for in Eastern Europe regarding Ukrainian refugees like uh, Polish, uh, Lithuanians, etc. They are all very happy to welcome uh, to welcome Ukrainian refugees because they are neighbors and all that. Uh, but uh, uh, they don't want Syrian, they don't want uh, Afghanistan's uh, people from Afghanistan, etc. etc. because they are, they are not neighbors, so to say. So he said, yeah, that's sad. Uh, I hope that the way we treat uh, Ukrainian is the way we should treat all uh, all uh, all refugees because uh, uh, someone who flees uh, war crime war crimes in in Ukraine is the same as someone fleeing a war crime in Ukraine, in in Syria, which legally speaking is right under under international law. 
uh, it's a status of asylum seekers. Uh, but yeah, he said, unfortunately, it's uh, uh, because of human nature, people are unlikely to, to change stance uh, that and keep treat uh, Ukrainians better than the, the, the other refugees. It was interesting that he said, yeah, there is double standard and unfortunately it will, it will stay the same. Uh, although Putin is using the same tactic than for Ukraine, he complained about the access to Crimea and uh, yeah, the, 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 the separatist... Uh, uh, the separatist republic. Yes, I mean, so going back to the map. Up, map. This time, let's go to Ukraine. So this, just double checking because I'm, my map is a bit bigger than uh, what you see there. Okay, yeah. So this is Crimea, this little bit. So you see here the, the little bit there. It's a border that nobody recognizes apart from, uh, apart from Russia. This is uh, Crimea. Crimea uh, is legally a part of Ukraine. But in 2014, Russia annexed uh, uh, the, the Crimea because, again, they had Sebastopol. Sebastopol had, uh, prior to, to 2014, and still the case, they had a military base there. The same thing that they have... Basically, Sebastopol was the equivalent of Kaliningrad here. So Sebastopol was the, uh, the, the, the center, the HQ, of the Russian fleets in the Black Sea. And so you add a Russian enclave in Sebastopol, right? So in the middle of, of Ukraine. And so uh, in 2014, Russia annexed, invaded and annexed uh, Crimea using at its advantage the, the civil war that was occurring in Ukraine, uh, between Ukraine and uh, the, the, the separatist republic of Luhansk and Donetsk. So, so basically this part of the country. Uh, and so they made a, a basically a fake referendum and they are next to, they are next to the country. So, and they use that under the argument that uh, Ukraine was uh, oppressing the Russian minority, that they were preventing access to uh, uh, of, uh, from Russia to Sebastopol, etc, etc. But you're right uh, in the sense that indeed they are using the same communication tactic, the same, the same playbook as they did in, uh, in, in Crimea, but again, there is a big, big, big geopolitical and military difference uh, between annexing Crimea and like trying to invade uh, Lithuania uh, to create a, a junction to, to Kaliningrad. Like, uh, let's say, if the Russians were saying not invading completely Lithuania, but invading, let's say, the, 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 cor the Sovakia corridor, so this part that, that connects Belarus to, uh, to Kaliningrad, still, there would be de facto a declaration of war on, on Lithuania and Poland. And, I mean, it would put NATO and also the EU to the test uh, because they would have to decide whether they declare war on, on Russia with all the, 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 the consequences uh, it would have. And bearing in mind that even if uh, EU, the EU, the US and all that, they are very keen on helping uh, Ukraine since the beginning of the invasion, everyone has been very, very clear that they do not want to become to be at war with Russia themselves. So France is happy to help Ukraine. France doesn't want to join the war and become be at war with Russia itself. So big difference. And I mean, uh, uh, Russia already said if Lithuania does, it will attack the UK. Oh, that's cute. That's cute. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's it's. Pretty cute because uh, again, like like he mentioned, and that's an obvious fact. If Russia is struggling against Ukraine uh, and Ukraine alone, imagine Russia, militarily speaking, fighting pretty much the entire EU, the US, Canada, and and a bunch of other country. Uh, I mean, it's not a funny scenario in the sense that there there is a real risk of uh, of nuclear escalation, but. Uh, that's not exactly a fight in which uh, Russia is, uh, uh, even on paper, having the, the upper end. Uh, but anyway, I, I thought it was interesting to, to show you on the map and, uh, and discuss that a bit. Uh, what else did we discuss? Uh, and yeah, we finally, we discussed the perspective of uh, Ukraine joining the EU. So tonight, uh, we have the leaders of uh, the European leaders, the, the, the head of state and governments of the uh, of uh, EU member states that are gathering in Brussels for so-called European Council, the, uh, the, the UCO as we call it in Brussels, 
And one thing that they are supposed to discuss is whether to accept uh, Ukraine's candidacy to join the EU. So, clarification. What, what they are discussing is whether to, dis to give to Ukraine the status of candidate country. It's not whether Ukraine will join the EU tomorrow. Uh, it's about do they have the status of candidate countries and if they, are, if they have the status of candidate countries, that opens the way for negotiations to, some point in the future, enter the EU. So, important thing, they're not discussing whether Ukraine will join the EU tomorrow. It's about whether negotiation can start. Uh, politically speaking, Ushakov said, said himself, uh, it's vital that, uh, that uh, the... the, the uh, the EU backs the, 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 the candidacy of, of Ukraine, so they approve it. And from what information that I've been leaking today, it seems that there is unanimity uh, between the member states that they will accept the, the status of candidate country for, uh, for Ukraine. And also, uh, shit, because they have to examine Ukraine candidacy, Moldova candidacy, and Georgia candidacy. So Georgia is, is right there. Oh, shit, I'm showing you the map, but you don't have the map. Sorry. Georgia, right here. Ukraine there. Moldova there. So these three uh, apply to join the EU, and uh, the member states are supposed to decide whether they can be candidate. And two out of the three will be granted. A, uh, actually, actually, the commission gave a, a, a positive assessment. I know Ukraine for sure, but I don't know if it's Moldova or Georgia that's, that is deemed insufficient at the time being. I, I I don't recall. Uh, maybe someone in the chat will uh, uh, will uh, will tell me. Uh, but anyway, bottom line is uh, politically they have to back uh, Ukraine's candidacy. Otherwise, it's a betrayal and uh, it sends a very very bad uh, political message to uh, Ukraine uh, right in the middle of the of the war. Uh, but it's going to be a, a long time before they join. Even if Ushakov uh, was implying that. Ukraine should be given, like, not a, a free pass, but uh, uh, there should be... The negotiations afterwards should be uh, politically uh, favorable to Ukraine so that they don't uh, slow down the process so that it lasts decades. Because actually to join the EU, once negotiation starts, you have many, 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 many things to discuss. It's called the, the Copenhagen Criteria. It's the conditions under which the uh, country, the, the conditions that the country must fulfill to join the EU. Uh, so it must uh, have democratic institutions, it must have a, a, a free uh, market economy, uh, it must be able to be economically sustainable, uh, economically sustainable enough to be able to face the competition, the, the, the competition of other European countries because. Ukraine would be entering the, the single market. They have to uh, align a lot of laws uh, between Ukraine and the EU because, of course, Ukraine would have to apply EU law. You have to do lots of things against corruption uh, for the rule of law, independence of the judiciary, etc., etc. And whatever goodwill, political goodwill uh, there is in the EU towards Ukraine, it remains a fact that there is a shit ton of corruption in Ukraine. There is shit ton of problem in the Ukrainian institutions, uh, problems in Notwithstanding even the, the, the question of the war, economically speaking, it's, uh, it's pretty difficult. And yeah, I was coming to that later, Mr. You're right. The sh there is also a, a political point that Europeans will have to, to, to deal with is the, just the size of Ukraine. I mean, uh, Ukraine is fucking huge. I mean, in terms of size, let, give me a sec. Uh, Ukraine size. Ukraine, okay, Ukraine, what is the size of Ukraine? Mm -mm -mm -mm. Where the fuck is it? Population area. So oh. 600,000 uh, square kilometers. Let's see, let's say Germany. Germany is half the size of Ukraine. Uh, Let's go back to the map. I can find it. So yeah, Ukraine, twice the size of, of, of Germany, which is fucking huge. Uh, that would upset, like you're, you're right, Andrews, that would tilt the balance between East and West in GDP. It depends on the population. What's the population in, uh, in Ukraine? 40 million. 
40 million uh, people estimated. So that would be a big country that uh, that's more or less the population of Spain, a bit bigger than Spain, uh, I, I believe. So that would upset a bit the, the, uh, a bit the voting power. But yeah, like, like he mentioned uh, the, the question of uh, of agriculture. Oh, uh, thanks for the thanks for the website. I'm actually going to check it out. True size. Ah, oh, that's awesome. Uh, search drag and compare size. Okay. Uh, what can I do? How can I do it? Go away. Uh, Ukraine. True size of Ukraine. Okay, and how do I do that? How does it work? I should not have. Uh... Oh, screw this! I, I will do that later. But yeah, uh, going back to the to the map, there is the indeed the problem. Uh, now I have to grab it. Oh, okay. I grab it. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. So Germany. So yeah, it's bi yeah bigger than France. So it's. Pretty much, uh, can, can you rotate it? No, you can't. So I would say that it's pretty much the size of... Oh, sorry, I, I have to put you set to in the script. It's France plus Benelux, basically. So yeah, uh, Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg plus France. That's more or less, looks like the size of, uh, uh, of, of Ukraine. Uh, but yeah, that's a neat tool, thanks. Uh, but yeah, you have problems uh, that you have to take into account. For instance, when it comes to agriculture, because... Ukraine is a huge, huge, huge agricultural country. Uh, and if they were to join, besides all the, the, of the regulation that they would have to imply, uh, apply, etc., that would be a big upset of the, 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 the EU market, the EU agricultural market, because it would be pretty much bigger than Poland, probably equivalent to France. So the big traditional agricultural, agricultural country would have suddenly to face a big, big competitor in Ukrainian uh, farmers. So that, that would be a big challenge. And you have that on a, on, on a number of, uh, of other sectors. So that's something that politically member states will have to take into account and that will play in the, um, in the uh, political decision whether the Ukraine is going to join uh, the EU. So it's something that will, I mean, or, that will take a lot of time. Uh, I, th I think that realistically speaking, it's not a process that will take one year, two year, five years. I think we're talking a, a good decade because uh, if we take on top of that the war, I mean, of course, Ukraine will not be able to join before the end of the war. Uh, and once the war is finished, uh, there will be a shit ton of reconstruction to do. Uh, the economy will have to be rebuilt, etc., etc. So it will be a long way before Ukraine is able to, to, to actually join the, join the EU. Uh, I think it's a, it's a reasonable ex uh, expectation to say that it will take at least a decade. But yeah, anyway. Uh, negotiation will also be need to be done in WTO, so World Trade Organization, as we are agriculture, so it's not only EU. Okay, I, I didn't know that also the... Ah, yes, indeed, because then in, in WTO, in the national, international organization, then you have to, to take that. Yeah, yeah, okay, I see, I see what you mean. Okay, but I, I, I had not thought about it. About uh, anyway, that's all I had on my uh, little piece of paper. If you have questions or comments, uh, do drop them now in the chat so that I can answer. In the meantime, I'm just scrolling back up to see. Uh, ah, yeah, Kavinsky is yeah, something that uh, indeed you mentioned that is also something to take into account is given the problems that the EU has right now with countries like Poland with and Hungary, uh, there will be a question mark on whether... Uh, the EU is able is ready to to handle uh, Ukraine in addition uh, because I mean uh, there is a big reluctance particularly in the uh, in the Western uh, European countries so uh, uh, France Netherlands uh, Spain etc because given the, the difficulty to integrate certain member states looking at you Poland looking at you Hungary when it comes to rule of law. Uh, but not only, uh, there, there are other issues. Uh, you, you can speak about the economic state of Romania or Bulgaria, this kind of thing. Uh, absorbing Ukraine and the, 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 uh, everything that goes with it, that's a, that's a big thing to, 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 to digest. And uh, there will be inevitably a question on wh whether the EU is, is ready to, to, to do that. Uh, but yeah, 
Looking forward to Sunday for the French elections review. Yes, I think that will be a good chunk of the uh, of the news review because there will be there's plenty of things to, to talk about about that and that has actually uh, consequences at uh, at EU level. Uh, there is more heretical idea among some Latvian support land bridge between Tallinn and Helsinki. Ah yes, I I had read about uh, about the, this indeed. Uh, the, the, this uh, uh, fuck this um, this bridge to, to connect with Finland. Yeah, yeah, I, I do. I have read about that. Anyway, um, that's all I had for you tonight. I don't see a lot of comments or questions, so I will go back to my uh, to my conclusion. So I hope that you enjoyed the, the, the interview. Uh, thanks again, Karim, and people who are uh, coming from Karim's channel for, for joining uh, the, 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 the channel. So we do here we do uh, interviews uh, with MEPs and other uh, funny, uh, fun stuff. Uh, next time I see you will be on Sunday uh, for the news review at 6 in French and at 8 in English, uh, where we do a bit of a... Uh, overview of the news, the EU news of the week, and discuss, uh, discuss them uh, with you for, for about an hour. Uh, we are slowly going towards the end of the season uh, because, uh, well, it's no surprise, uh, we there will be a summer break. Uh, and as usual, as usual, I mean, I did it last year. I will stop. Uh, I will stop the season like probably uh, second week of of. Uh, uh, of July, so I'm slowly closing things down, which gives me time to to upgrade my setup, prepare the next season, uh, get get people for interviews, like uh, get get your feedback to see how I, what I need to change with the uh, with with the channel, etc. But yeah, for now I don't have an interview with uh, with an MEP next week. I will see if I can I can get someone, uh, but I will still be streaming something. Don't worry about it. Huh? I have to, I'm still doing for the French speakers uh, the review of the. Uh, of the TV show Parliament, uh, which is taking place in the European Parliament, uh, I will still have the news review. But yeah, just to letting you letting you know that slowly we're going towards the end of the of the season, uh, and we will have to organize something for the end of this, of the season, a special event. I, I don't know yet what I will do. Uh, I, I need to to gather my thoughts and, and organize all that. But anyway, all that to say, if you like what you saw or you're interesting to see more, of course, uh, feel free. To uh, follow the channel, you can also follow me on my other uh, social media, uh, Twitter, Discord, uh, Facebook, YouTube, all the good things are there. You just have to click the link. Uh, if you feel mighty generous, you can even sub to the channel. You can toss a coin to your streamer via coffee and all that. Uh, you know the drill. And yeah, on this note, I wish you all a good evening and I hope to see you on Sunday or sometime next week. Have a good one, guys. See you.